here, we're talking about antipressive theory or feminist theories, uh, critical, theories. critical theories, and so what does that mean or look like in practice? From what I'm hearing, you also have to have a good understanding of understanding policies and laws and also be prepared for whatever the world gives you. <laughs> so what are the, I guess my question then, are what are the skills um, that would be helpful for students to know coming in? Having been graduates as well, like what, or from each of your perspectives, what are the skills that you look for? Some of the theories that really get put to practice is sort of around the anti-oppressive practice, um, critical thinking, um, with it, it can be such a subjective area, and um, I think it was like Cindy Blackstock once, it's like everything is, almost everything is a gray area. Understanding how to work across difference and know where families are coming from, or at least trying to even understand a little bit more. Um, being able to sort of ask those questions and self-reflect and wonder, you know, where are, are your biases coming into play? And, um, I know it's something that we talk about, especially in social work, because I'm, I'm just finishing now, that we go over and over and over, and it's it's not enough, almost. You're, you'll think about it, and you'll be like, oh yeah, totally fine. But if you take that time to self-reflect, you'll be like, oh, maybe I was doing that, or maybe something from my perspective was coming into play. Um, so I guess that one was the biggest one for myself. She said, everything is a gray area, According to our funders, it's quite black and white, so it's tricky. You have to hustle, right? You have to learn how to do this kind of like dance <laughs> to keep your funding and to um, represent your agency well in the community, but while also still doing what has to be social justice work with clients. So there's no way you could be apolitical in this field. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's about social justice, and so there's nothing more rewarding to me than teaching somebody how to self-advocate. So how to write a letter to the minister and then CC the opposition so you get your letter read. How to work with um, others in the community. I think growing your, your own professional network is absolutely key. And Victoria is a very um, wonderful city when it comes to professional colleagues. I've met a lot of really left-leaning, really progressive, really activist-centered folks and other agencies that do the dirty work that I can't do because of my funding, which is great. You know, I might ask our students at the back there, and I told you I'd put you on the spot, just um, <laughs> <laughs> what skills do you think you are drawing on in coming into the work uh, mm -hmm. of the agency? It's, uh, there's many aspects to our day that you wouldn't expect, so you're talking about not being able to speak um, really freely about what you do. We often bring federal MPs in on our causes. We, um, mm -hmm. we have many players that come into an adoption for us. So, for example, right now, Russia has said absolutely no Russian children leaving their borders. To, to countries that allow same-sex marriage. Mm. We have children who have been adopted um, by Canadians sitting in orphanages. The paperwork's all done, but they're not allowed to leave the country. So we're advocating for those children through whatever means we can, and usually it means bringing in the highest power we can, the, pre the Prime Minister's office, whatever it might be. So I don't think our students, and certainly I, stepped into this job thinking I'd be working at that level as well. So many aspects to it. When you're researching a new country, um, to potentially have an agreement with for adoption, then there's so many extra elements to it with regards to child trafficking and that sort of sort of stuff. And it's uh, it's really interesting, especially when it's a non hag country and it's yeah, there's so many regulations and making sure that the child is actually available for adoption. And yeah, so that that's an interesting social justice kind of perspective, I think. Yeah. The huge gap between what I thought I knew or what I thought I learned and then reality um, and and not being terrified when I don't know the answer not trying to think I have to come up with something and I'm always in a very dangerous place when I think oh, I gotta think of something right now whenever I think of that when that thought goes through my mind I know it's time to stop now I need to stop whatever I'm doing because if I'm trying to come up with an answer I'm in a dangerous place. So it's okay that I don't know the answer. It's okay I have to go ask someone else. It's okay I have to take a breath and just think for a minute. And critical thinking, start to imagine outside of the box. So I think for me, a lot of it is just um, whatever I learned, if I can suspend that, hold it, honor it, use it. But if I can just be okay with it, I don't have all the answers. Humility goes a long way. 
wherever I'm going, just go in low <laughs> and be kind. And when I don't know, I just say, I, I don't know. We are running into such a re regulatory system through child welfare right now that we are, mm -hmm. we're hitting a lot of roadblocks, especially um, around, you know, First Nations families, um, the education ones coming up right now a lot for a lot of our families, um, just, you know, keeping kids in school and what that looks like and um, just sort of trying to get people to understand sort of the history behind that and why that maybe isn't happening and why these kids aren't going to school regularly and, you know, these things are turning into child protection concerns and we're going, whoa, 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 let's back up and look at what we can do rather than what you want them to do. We have a job to do. This is where we're hitting. Um, you know, we have certain you know protocols that we need to follow. Mm -hmm. So it's really affecting um, definitely frontline, and our families mm -hmm. are going through a lot of it. You know, because they're going so well on a process um, with their families, and even you know they have their kids back. Everything's going well, um, but they're still transitioning. And you know, if the history behind you know families in school or even children being removed you know from school mm -hmm. it's like let's look at what happened you know um, so I guess sort of stuff like that where it's you know it's in their boxes you know it's like this is what has to be done mm -hmm. um, in this particular way really hard to um, to make it in Victoria it's really difficult to get yourself in the door in a lot of places and I worry that more regulation is just going to be more barriers to work in the field of adoption other than a government you must have a registration, you must be <coughs> recognized as a registered social worker, which means now, of course, you must maintain professional development hours, you yeah. must uh, make sure that you are competent in, in really specific areas, and I, I guess I personally don't see the fight. Um, I think it identifies social work as a profession, as other professions have long done, um, so I, I don't see it as a bad thing. We have at least 90 social workers around the province who do contract adoption work for us, home studies. They must be registered to do that kind of work. It's government that doesn't have to register as social worker, or social workers are always choosing not to at this point, and I don't think that's consistent across the country. And I, you know, I think it, I, you know, I'm pretty sure Alberta and Ontario at least you know, have to work in government social work, you must be a registered social worker. So it's a, a wave that is coming, and is, is it futile fighting against it? I'm not sure, but I think we would agree that it is a really good thing. Um, mm -hmm. There's many standards already set inside the adoption legislation, inside the Hague Intercountry Convention on Intercountry Inter Adoption sets a very high bar for completing work. Um, and I think social work education ties into that very well. Our goal was to really think about the theories and what it looks like in practice, and I think you've shared that, and some of the, the challenges. And, and I also think there's a lot of successes. Um, in, in the work that we do as well. Our job as social workers is to empower people mm. to become their own advocates. And I remember my work with First Nations in the center of BC, and I went into it just trembling. <laughs> and the, I was supposed to train them to become their own helpers. And it was just the most wonderful experience I had because I didn't tell them what to do. I gave them, asked them the questions, and they became their um, own advocates, and they were empowered to do what they needed to do. And you can put that on every field. You can do that in adoption. It's harder sometimes because people feel entitled, mm -hmm. especially adopting parents. But if you empower people and enable them to fit, fulfill that role and, and utilize the skills they have, I think you've done your job. I always had good support. I had good managers. I had good workmates. And, uh, and I tr trust that will be happening for you as well. Uh, it doesn't always happen. But uh, I think, I guess I'm here also to support membership in BCSW, <laughs> where I feel I've had support over the many years, uh, because we don't all have to be doing the precise same job to be experiencing challenges. With funding, number one, uh, government decisions and that sort of thing. Yeah. So good for you guys. When I think about who I hope our students are when they graduate and they're, and they're working in community is that they're someone that walks with a great deal of humility and um, I actually see a really 
nice blending of the idea of theory and practice. And I know for myself that, that the theories that we talk about in the school are about walking with humility. We, one, of, one of my favorite authors in our program, Uma Narayan, talks about when we're outsiders to another's experience, then how, how do we have to figure out how we walk and what, how we need to remain accountable to the work and, and the people that we're working with. So my hope too is that our students that you're working with are very critically self-reflective, right? That they're always, in fact, this is something we hear across the country about our graduates from our school, is how critically self-reflective they are, right? So we can learn all the best skills in the world um, and apply them very badly if we don't have that ability to just look at ourselves, locate ourselves, situate ourselves, and recognize what, what we don't know, right? So that I'm teaching students that question, what is it that I'm missing here because this isn't my experience? I think it helps to make us stay humble in the work that we do. So I just wanted to just mention that. That really resonated with me that you mentioned that. I'm wondering what you would suggest to our students in terms of um, self-care for yourself. And what sustains you? What excites you? What you work? Making sure that you take out time to celebrate the families that you work with. Um, at Haliton, we're really good at sort of acknowledging and um, holding up the families when they have success. I've managed a lot of teams, and I've got a, they've always been great, but this is a particularly good one I've got right now. There's about 11 people, and we just are very flexible about um, supporting each other. Not flexible about supporting each other. We're always supporting each other. We're flexible about the time. The time that people come in in the day or leave at the end of the day. Just a lot of room for whatever's going on in an individual's mm -hmm. life. So that's that's just the core of, of um, keeping it healthy. We have a seminar site that happens when students are in field placements. And so it's, it's a, a, an amazing place for me as an instructor to be as well because obviously what happens on those sites there's, we, we talk about confidentiality, none of that is ever breached, but people talk in generalities about things that they're witnessing sometimes in field placements that feel like there's a disconnect or they're not sure how to process that, right? So it's a great place, which feels like a safe enough place for them to actually process those things. And um, often that's the theme that emerges, right? And, and I sense this theme emerging. I know it, I know when it comes and, and have some of my strategies about how to deal with that, but lo and behold, that theme was emerging in the class, and uh, one of the students, who happens to be Leanne's students, said, my practicum supervisor had me go around the office and check in with everyone that works there about how they sustain themselves and how they resist. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I never had a chance to tell you this, but she, so she wrote that in her small group, and she, she spoke in generalities, and it was amazing, an amazing piece of work. And I asked her if it would be okay if we spread that to the entire class, to the other 30-some students. And uh, so that went viral on our, on our site, right? And so people were talking about, so then we, had, we moved into a really creative piece following up on that about resistance. And based on what the folks that you work with um, said about how they resist and how they stay strong and how they, they sustain themselves.